Oh, welcome back to the Patterson Podcast. Uh, today's going to be a real treat for me because I've got uh, someone who I really admire on this call. Uh, he's the creator of the incredibly useful website called nutritionfacts.org, a very, very handy website for all scientific related matters. Um, and he's just released a book, How Not to Die. And I haven't read that yet, but... Uh, Rest assured, I'll be getting my hands on that because I'm a big fan. Uh, he's much loved and adored. He's a leader within the plant-based community. It is Dr. Michael Greger. How are you, Dr. Greger? I'm doing good, thank you. Now, you're there on a uh, walking machine. You're keeping fit while we do this podcast. I'm keeping fit while I do everything. Yes, uh, 17 miles a day. So what is that? What is uh, 17 miles in kilometers? Oh, I'm guessing about 25. Let's see, 17 miles in kilometers, 27. Oh, well, I wasn't too far off. Not bad, 27, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, sitting is not good for us. Right, right. Well, uh, let me tell you, I'm going to stand up as well. So I'm going to get on my knees. That's the best I can do, <laughs> given that I'm limited. <laughs> I'm on my knees right now. All, All right. right. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna walk on my knees, which I found was quite good for actually uh, re repairing some of my knee damage in my left knee. So uh, that suits me. Okay. Now I want to pick your brain today. You're a very busy man, so uh, let's get straight into this. Uh, first of all, I just want uh, a bit of your background. I know we can research this online, but give us the bullet points. How you ended up into uh, recommending more plants to people? How how did this uh, eventuate for someone who's a medical doctor? Right. Well, you know, it was actually my grandmother. You know, I think the the spark for many kids to want to be a you know doctor when they grow up is watching a grandparent get sick or even die. But for me, it was watching my grandma get better. She had uh, diagnosed with end stage heart disease. She already had so many uh, bypass operations. She basically run out of plumbing at some point. And so there's nothing more you know uh, conventional medicine could do. And so they. Um, you know, sent her home to die, can find a wheelchair crushing chest pain. Her life was over at age 65. And then uh, she heard on this uh, program in the States called 60 Minutes about this guy called Nathan Pritikin, this early lifestyle medicine pioneer back in the 70s, um, who had just opened this clinic in California. She's actually featured as one of his early success stories in his biography. It talks about Francis Greger who showed up, they wheeled her in, a few weeks later she was walking 10 miles a day and went on to live another 31 years on this world, on this planet um, uh, until 96 with her six grandkids including me so not only did she inspire one to go to medical school, she saw, lived to see him graduate and uh, so what, did, what was the magic? The magic was putting on a plant-based diet with a kind of graded exercise program and her body healed itself, and I think that's uh, that's why not only I went into medicine, but why I practice the medicine I do today, which is lifestyle medicine, using diet to not only prevent disease, but to treat it, and in many cases even reverse it. And how long have you been uh, on a plant-based diet? Uh, 25 years now, since 1990, since summer 1990, when Dr. Dean Ornish published uh, the Lifestyle Heart Trial in The Lancet. Uh, probably the most prestigious medical journal in the world, and there it was. And so basically, he did what Pritikin did, but he did what's called quantitative angiography. He actually looked at the arteries, special x-rays, and could see and could prove this reversal that our family had already known. But uh, so it was a randomized controlled trial. Half the people went on a plant-based diet or the healthy lifestyle behaviors. The other half just did regular, you know, did whatever their doctors told them. And of course, they got worse, and mm. uh, the people that uh, ate better got better, and their arteries literally opened up without drugs, without surgery, um, you know, suggesting that their bodies wanted to heal all along, but were just never given the choice. But you stop eating an artery-clogging diet, and your body can able, is able to start dissolving some of that plaque away. And look, so it's essentially the cure to our number one killer, the number one killer of men and women. We've known it for 25 years, and uh, it's, uh, so the, the, qu the real question is, why do hundreds of thousands of people still die from a disease that's preventable and reversible? Well, that's a very good question. I, I've, seen your, I've seen your presentation uprooting the uh, leading causes of death. In fact, that's the first time that my wife and I became exposed to your work, and since then we've 
followed the oh, uh, the evolution up to your really successful wow. nutritionfacts.org. Yeah, we've been fans yeah, for years. Yeah, that's it's been a couple of years now. That's right. And in fact, one of your um, videos that you put together, just to give you some direct feedback about how transformative some of the work you do can can happen on an individual level. Uh, you may recall one that you did about potassium and rheumatoid arthritis. I'm not yeah. sure if it jogs a memory. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The study involved taking a group of RA folks through a, a increased potassium intake versus a control right. group. And those who took the potassium supplements uh, quite substantially and significantly improved. And that was at that point that I started supplementing potassium with a little magnesium. Oh. And uh -huh. uh, I, I, I feel that it actually did, uh, did help me get over the line when I was just smoldering with some um, mm. residual pain towards, towards the end. So that was uh, that. That video uh, played a role for me. Now we've, we've we've got an audience listening to this who have inflammatory arthritic conditions, um, and you're close to the science on uh, on across a broad range of of, of diseases and conditions. Um, would you would would you say that um, there is a big disconnect between what we understand? Um, about what diet can do with arthritic conditions to where the medical community is at in terms of where they're treating it. And I'll give you an example. Um, it seems that if I speak to uh, anyone who shares your sort of uh, train of thought uh, in terms of, uh, you know, leaky gut, dietary, you know, all that sort of side of things, compared to, say, your rheumatologist that works uh, in the local, you know, community, um, there seems to be that disconnect that, that is frustrating for a lot of my clients who, who don't have the support from their doctors. So do you feel that the science is going to catch up and allow our medical practitioners at that top level to see that it, there is such a large role that diet is playing? Yeah, so it's not the science that needs to catch up. It's the doctors that need to catch up to the science. But, I mean, you know, this is nothing new. You know, my latest kind of annual review, you know, I talk about... Uh, you know, uh, what mainstream medicine thought about smoking right back in the 1950s. We had decades of research proving that smoking was associated with lung cancer, yet, I mean, the science was there, but smoking was normal. Most doctors smoked. I mean, you know, the per capita uh, smoking rate here in the States is uh, uh, 10 cigarettes a day, about 4,000 per year. Um, and so the average American smoked half a pack a day. And so when it was just normal, it, all this evidence suggesting that it was bad for you was just kind of dismissed because it's like, how could something that's just everybody does, how could it be bad for you? Um, and then, of course, there's a very powerful industry uh, throwing lots of money around to silence the, uh, the, the, the medical world. But, and so, I mean, you, you know, looking back at that situation, where it was just a mountain of evidence. So by the time in the 1960s, when the U.S. Surgeon General came out with the first report saying, okay, smoking's bad for you, they had accumulated 7,000 studies. <laughs> so you'd think maybe after the first 6,000, it could have given people a heads up, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if they came out, I mean, so, sir, I mean, so <laughs> like, if, if, if that report came out a year early, year earlier it would have saved that many more lives right it's like how much science do you need to be able to you know balance the kind of corporate interests that are trying to silence the science and so um and so it it was just a matter of society catching up with the science on one hand you know you had all of society mainstream medicine uh, you know even the government telling you to smoke on the other side you just had the science if you even knew about the science. I mean, all, what was being published back then and how would you know? Because it never really made it out into the news. And, and so we have a very similar situation today. We have this mountain of science showing that we can, for example, reverse heart diseases. I mean, okay, so obviously since 1990, not a single person has died of a heart attack, right? Because we have the cure. I mean, we already have it, right? And so you wait a second. And that was my big wake-up call, that there was more to medicine than just the science. I mean, that was very naive of me to think that, oh, well, okay, we found the best treatment, safer, cheaper, more effective than everything else. Well, then obviously that's the standard of care. Um, and that actually was what triggered my work on Nutrition Facts and all my, I mean, that, was, that made my life's mission. Well, wait a second. If the number one if the killer number one kill if the cure to the number one killer can be buried, 
in some rabbit hole somewhere, what else is there that could be helping my patients, right? I mean, and so with rheumatoid arthritis, with diabetes, with hypertension, all these other things, where there's this really amazing research that never makes it out to the world because there's no profit motive, there's no press release, there's no ads on TV because no one's making any money, yet millions of people could be profiting in their own lives in terms of better health. And so it's not like we needed more science, we just need to take the science that was already there and just let everybody know about it. Okay. And the public is as just as much in the dark as the medical professionals because how are doctors taught? Doctors are taught, I mean, you open up a medical journal, the random medical journal, what's it about? It's about drugs. Why? Because the drug companies fund their own studies and so that's those are the studies that get done. And those are the ones you hear about because there's ads on TV here in the States for um, uh, for, for, for literally drugs on primetime TV, yet you'll never see a, an ad for sweet potatoes. You'll never see an ad for broccoli, right? Because there's no profit margin. There's just, you can't make any money off of it. Yet, so a new study comes out on broccoli, completely no one ever hear about it. And so that's really what I did. And so, but it's not that doctors don't want to know. It's that they just don't know. They were never taught this. They're just, so, you know, it's just a matter of saying, have you seen this? This is amazing. I mean, they do these studies where they do, you know, head-to-head -head comparisons between the leading drug. Like, if they, this is the leading drug for migraines, for whatever. Compare that to Food X. I mean, that easy. Um, and in many cases, the food can work just as well or better than the drug. And even if it works just as well, the food still wins because it doesn't have any side effects. And it's cheaper. And it's, I mean, so... You know, and uh, and so it, these are, these are tools that physicians just don't have in their toolbox. But once they learn about it, they get just as excited as anybody. I mean, uh, I mean, doctors. Look, if doctors wanted to make money, they'd go to the stock market or something. I mean, the the doctors became doctors because at some level, at least early on, they wanted to help people. They wanted to make people better. Yeah. And here, and it's very frustrating to treat autoimmune conditions. It's right because people don't get better. You just keep adding drugs, try to control the symptoms, then then you add drugs to control the side effects of the first round of drugs you gave. I mean, it's it's frustrating for patient, it's frustrating for physician. I mean, you just it's just not very, I mean, the only like happy medicine is like, you know, obstetricians, you know, give them, you know, delivering babies, right? Yeah. Every other doctor is in a really, Right? It's not a very, it Maybe, doesn't have a great professional life. Maybe a doctor who works in autoimmune once a year gets to deliver a baby so that he That's, gets to stimulate his excitement. Uh, right, right. That, that should be the Christmas reward once a year. Right, um, you get to deliver a baby. Yeah, absolutely. Have you ever, have you ever had the pleasure? Oh, yeah. No, of course. Of oh, course. Awesome. Awesome. I mean, it's, 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 it's actually, uh, yeah, it, <laughs> it, it's, it's very stressful. So, I mean, you know, obviously. Sure, sure. But that's why. Uh, but, that's what... uh, right, right. It's not, it's not the beatific scene yeah. that you imagine. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, no, no. But it's uh, afterwards, it feels good. Sure, sure, sure. Um, you, you've campaigned, uh, I've watched a video, you campaigned towards the uh, national dietary guidelines to try and make some of the changes that you recommend so that the public can be encouraged to go down this direction. So you're hitting it from many angles. How was that received? And do you do it every year? Or, or was it first year this year for you? No, no. So uh, the, the uh, dietary guidelines for Americans is updated every five years. So I have every five years I go and I testify off of my. And so this year I actually went twice. There were multiple hearings. And I went before, after the recommendations were um, revealed. And in fact, so the 2015 guidelines are not yet released. Um, in 2010, they didn't come out until January 2011. So, but we assume within the next month or so, we'll see them. And so we'll see if they took any of uh, my and other uh, lifestyle medicine practitioner suggestions into account. I uh, certainly hope so, because that really determines, you know, what's being fed in schools and the military and prisons. And I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, right. that, that's, that's the yeah. guideline for kind of government feeding programs. And so that affects a lot of people. Absolutely. Now, can we get a little specific? I want I, I want to actually just pick your brains a little bit, um, and uh, what you've what you've come to feel about autoimmune conditions. Do you feel that all autoimmune disease, diseases do have 
a very similar underlying cause and that the symptom is just uh, different across the different names? Um, well, I mean, underlying cause is a very basic biochemical level, but um, can have vastly um, different triggers, different manifestations, different clinical courses. Uh, but what's really exciting is that uh, you know, they all manifest with this inflammation and there are indeed, you know, dietary interventions that can decrease inflammation within the body and seem to help through a wide variety. And so someone may come up to me and say, okay, well, what about, you know, uh, you know, Sjogren's or some, some other yeah. autoimmune disease where there's really no sign. I mean, there just haven't been any studies looking at dietary interventions. And I say, look, there haven't been any studies, so the, the answer to your question is we don't know if it'll help, but the nice thing about eating healthy is that there's no downside, right? I mean, there's no like, I mean, you know, before you take a new drug, right, you want to make sure the benefits outweigh the risks because, I mean, you know, drugs can kill you. So, but when it comes to eating healthy, it's like, you know, or quitting smoking or any kind of safe, simple, side effect free solution, well, then. Why not? I mean, it works against all these other autoimmune diseases, right? I mean, so there's successful dietary trials against lupus, against rheumatoid arthritis, against osteoarthritis, which has an inflammatory component. And so all these other things, maybe it'll help. It certainly can't hurt. And even if it doesn't help with your particular condition, the number one killer of people with autoimmune disease is still heart disease. I mean, still all the other killers. I mean, it's just, you know, I mean, uh, so, I mean, all you're going to get is benefit. So in the worst case scenario, you're going to benefit, feel better, live longer, right? And people who are sick, the last thing they need is a second disease, right? Yeah. Bad enough to have rheumatoid arthritis. How about rheumatoid arthritis? Oh, and kidney failure or rheumatoid arthritis and diabetes, right? I mean, it's bad enough you have to deal with it. So you must be able to be absolutely healthy, even if it didn't help for that particular disease. So eat healthy across the board for everybody. Yeah, well, I can support that uh, from a point of view, specifically the Shrojans, those people who followed my program. I've had a lot of anecdotal evidence that uh, that condition has improved. Um, so, you know, I do feel that <clears throat> with these inflammatory sort of conditions that I've worked with, uh, certainly they there's no, <laughs> put it this way, none of them ever get worse by making these changes. Mm -hmm. Nothing's mm -hmm. ever worsened. Um, so Dr. McDougall, who I also uh, enjoy uh, following, uh, he, he has, you know, put on some of his public talks that rheumatoid arthritis is a, uh, is a dietary disease, um, which, you know, has kind of uh, ruffled the feathers of a, of a few rheumatologists that I communicate with. Um, I think that's a, you know, that's certainly uh, uh, the, the camp that I sort of sit in. Do you feel that... Um, uh, do you feel that it's that simple or do you feel that there are other factors in, at play? Um, uh, well, no, it's not always the case. I mean, if by dietary disease you're saying that it's always the case, it's not true. And the reason and the way you know that is because by fasting, so therapeutic fasting, so if you do like a physician-supervised water-only fast, which is done sometimes for autoimmune disease. Yeah, most autoimmune diseases actually get better. Yeah, in fact, um, I, I, in fact, I recall one study where fourteen people with RA did a water fast for for two weeks, and virtually all their symptoms was gone after two weeks. And that's the case for most of my clients. Nine out of ten, all pain gone in a couple of days. Okay, now, so yeah. it's the one out of ten. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so if one out, if somebody eat, drinking consuming just water doesn't get better, then it's not dying. Well, right? hang on I a mean, second. So then, I got, right. I've got a theory on this, Dr. Greg. All right, talk to me. My theory, which I have uh, sort of co-created with, uh, with uh, a, 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 uh, actually a chiropractor out of the US, my theory is that it's the, the proteins in the pathogenic bacteria that the body is reacting to in the one in 10 cases where they're not eating food. So that's my thought. Uh, my feeling is that they're circulating these pathogenic bacteria in their bloodstream still and that the proteins in the uh, 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 in the bacteria are still causing uh, uh, antibodies to be created to the to the bacterial proteins and to the lining of the joints that's my so you're thought. saying so you, and you're saying those bacteria are a consequence of a diet yes from from before they did the fast maybe I over see. The, okay yeah. 
All right. No, that's an interesting theory. Okay. Yeah. So, um, well, in that case, there then uh, one could make the case that there are, that both in direct and indirect ways it can be considered a dietary disease. I mean, but the fact that you put people on a fast and the majority or even one gets better. If yeah. one out of ten got, if one out of hundred got better, then there's obviously a dietary component, right? I mean, and so. What more do you need to tell these doctors? Yeah. Now, obviously, that's not sustainable. By definition, a fast isn't sustainable. But then if you, you know, do an elimination diet, start adding back foods and see what inflames your joints, um, you know, that can really kind of give you some guidance. Um, but, you know, it takes time. It takes energy. It's so, so much easier for a doctor to just write a script and hand it to you. Um, but, uh, you know, you want to, tr- whenever possible, you want to treat the cause, the underlying cause, and not just kind of suppress the inflammatory symptoms. You want to get at the root of inflammation. And I don't know, did you see my um, the Proteus mirabilis uh, video I did about bacteria about and the, rheumatoid arthritis? Yeah, yeah, um, and you can explain that a little bit more um, to listeners, but it's about a specific strain of bacteria that has been identified to be in higher prevalence with people with RA than in a control group, yes? Yeah, so there was a uh, there was this famous study where they um, uh, this 13 month randomized controlled trial of for rheumatoid um, uh, uh, arthritis patients put on a strictly plant based diet uh, for three and a half months and then switched to an egg free lacto vegetarian diet uh, for the remainder of the study and compared to the control group. Um, they didn't change their diet at all. The plant-based group significant improvement in everything down the line: grip strength, uh, joint stiffness, fewer tender joints, less you know, all down the list. Less tenderness per joint, less swelling. All the you know laboratory, you know the C-reactive protein, white count, everything. Okay, um, and uh, and the question is, well, kind of what's going on? Um, and uh, so one of this kind of leading theories. Um, is that is this molecular mimicry theory? The thought that um, which originally came out of um, uh, kind of the, the rheumatic heart disease, where if you get, uh, for example, strep throat, um, uh, your in your your the reason it's so important to treat strep throat is because when your body mounts in a response, an antibody response to destroy the strep bacteria, um, there's actually a protein that mimics. There's a protein in the bacteria that looks a lot like a protein in our heart. And when the body attacks this bacteria, um, our heart gets kind of caught in the crossfire, in the kind of friendly fire, um, and and you can get serious valvular disease kind of later in life. And so the thought is that a similar uh, thing is going on in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, And so one of the clues to where this infection might, uh, like how do you start looking to see? Well, a clue is that, you know, rheumatoid arthritis is seen about three times more frequently in women than men. You say, well, wait a second, what infection do women get more than men? Urinary tract infections, bladder infections. So women get more. And so, um, uh, indeed, uh, so they started testing the urine of uh, rheumatoid arthritis sufferers, and lo and behold, did indeed find this uh, this bacteria called Proteus mirabilis um, uh, that um, uh, that uh, that does have this molecule that looks lo- an awful lot like the molecule in our joints, um, and so these anti-Proteus antibodies against the bacteria may inadvertently attack our own joint tissues, leading to this kind of joint destruction, um, and uh, so. Uh, um, and of course, where do bladder infections come from? Many people don't realize bladder infections actually come from uh, bacteria in the rectum that kind of creep up into the bladder up through the urethra. And so, well, wait a second, how do you change the bacteria in your colon? You do it by changing your diet. Um, and so that's where uh, that this is kind of the, the detective story route that led us to dietary changes. Um, and so, and so we have decades, uh, studies going back decades, showing that people going on, for example, raw vegan diets get these dramatic shifts in their gut bacteria. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, you put rheumatoid sufferers on that kind of diet, 
you get the experience, you get the relief, you get greater improvements actually tied to some of the changes in gut flora. So you yeah. um, basically, basically culture people's stool and you can see the people that get better have certain shifts in bacteria that the ones that don't. Um, uh, and uh, so um, since then they've also tried uh, uh, plant-based diets including both a combination of cooked and raw foods um, uh, which uh, also benefited well. Um, uh, and what you see when you put people on a plant-based diet is you see a drop in anti-proteus antibodies um, uh, uh, compared to the control group. Um, and so um, now you say, well, wait a second, maybe your immune system has just declined. No, you have the same level of antibodies against other invaders, against other bacteria, but just specifically lower proteins. And so the thought is um, that you know, when you shift over to a more plant-based diet, you actually get a profound influence on the composition of the urine. So, for example, there are these plant compounds called lignans, which have, uh, that end up more in the urine of those eating plants, and so higher levels. And they actually have antibacterial properties. Um, so the thought is maybe um, either we're changing the bacteria in our colon or we're eating all these like uh, antimicrobial plant compounds that are being excreted into the urine and, and, and killing off this bacteria. So regardless of how it's happening, we know we have less of this immune overreaction to the specific bacteria associated with rheumatoid arthritis. And so, you know, as you can, so there's still so much more work to be done in this area, but you don't have to wait until we figure out exactly what it is. Is it because of changes in the bladder or changes in the colon? Either way, the diet works. So you do the diet and then we'll look, if we figure it out, maybe we can tweak it even better to make it more effective. But until we know, might as well jump on board because it's just going to have beneficial side consequences. Absolutely. Uh, and you mentioned raw food diet earlier on there. Um, I, I personally uh, went through an eight months raw food uh, and that was very, very difficult. I sprouted all my nuts and my seeds wow. uh, trying to, you know, increase digestibility and con uh, enzyme content and um, lived off just, uh, you know, tons and tons of, uh, you know, nuts and seeds were my, were my calories and uh, uh -huh. fruit, fruits and tons and tons of greens. I found that nothing is more healing than consuming leafy greens, just all the plain oh, salads. Yeah. Without the without the oils, just completely uh, uh, plain salads were and 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 juicing of those leafy greens uh -huh. uh, and right. green vegetables played a dramatic role in in pain reduction. Great, yeah. So so now um, I mean, I, and, and and in that way, I think people with these inflammatory conditions are lucky in that their body is actually telling them yes. what's healthy, what's not healthy. Right? When most people eat greens, they may not feel differently. And so there's no there you know they don't have this kind of built-in compliance mechanism yeah. to kind of right but people who are really sensitive right and experience the benefits that gives them extra motivation to continue eating healthy. I mean if only you know every time somebody ate a salad they felt better then the problem would be solved, right? Right. And so you should see this as a bit like my body is super smart. Yeah. And it's telling me what I should eat, and I should follow its advice. Yeah, that's certainly a train of thought that I've shared with others, and it's something that, it, it, as a as a roundabout way, is a benefit of having uh, an inflammatory condition. There's no doubt about that. Um, do you know Dr. Monica Agarwal out of Baltimore? Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, she's friends with uh, Dr. Esselstyn, and he's encouraged her to try and compile a, a bunch of uh, sort of... Uh, results of people who have benefited from a plant-based diet with uh, right. uh, and try and compile that as a study and I'm working with her to uh, to put together that case and a few other of our uh, well not oh, our good. few other uh, doctors and um, we you know there's there's a few stumbling blocks aren't there with red tape issues and things to to get these things over the line um, but anyway we're, we're working on that at the moment Simultaneously, right. back here in Australia, there's a there's a collaborative group who's interested in in looking at my work and 
trying to uh, publish that as well. Um, Wonderful. I haven't published anything since I was a laser physicist when I was 23 <laughs> years old in a journal called Electronics Letters. Um, mm. And... Uh, uh, and nothing certainly in the uh, in the medical space. Um, is it is? I just wanted to ask you um, how difficult is it to get something like that accepted? Um, we uh, we're just uh, looking at possibly doing a, a documentary about my journey and and looking at taking some Whoa. people. Yeah, and, yeah, and uh, and looking at taking some people through this process and get that journey that they go through. Um, is it on a scale of one to ten? How hard is it to get this sort of stuff published? Uh, not hard at all anymore. And the reason is, is because there's been an explosion of open access online journals. So, I mean, it used to be, you know, journals would be published in print form. And so page space was at a, I mean, a real premium. And so there was, I mean, you know, there's only so many articles you can fit, so they really had to restrict it. But now, I mean, there are many journals are now completely online. I mean, they don't e exist in print. And so, I mean, it, it costs a little extra in terms of editing or something, but they can print as many articles and edition as they want. Um, and so they no longer have those restrictions. So if it's a good paper, they'll do it. And there are um, case reports published all the time. In fact, there's whole journals dedicated to publishing case reports and case series. Um, uh, the British Medical Journal just uh, picked up uh, fasting, um, uh, a remarkable fasting case report out of the Two North Clinic in uh, California. Oh, Dr. Clapper. That showed this. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, yeah Goldhammer and Clapper showed this um, uh, dramatic reversal in lymphoma with water-only fasting. Um, with some amazing imaging, and they're getting that published in the British Medical Journal, which is a which is an excellent journal. Um, and so, I mean, that just shows. I mean, the the biggest obstacle to pu obstacle to publishing the medical literature is the researcher not submitting it. That's really the. I mean, no, seriously, that's the that's the. I mean, you know, and you may not be accepted by the first few that you uh, that you approach, but. You know, uh, these journals are desperate for good content, and uh, you know, I mean, ideally, you'd get um, those that are indexed by um, by Medline, by you know, which are which is the U.S. National Library of Medicine. It's kind of the largest medical database, and so if if something's published in a journal that's indexed by them, it'll show up and doing a PubMed search, and so it'll have greater access. More people will be able to read it. Um, but uh, th that I would be really surprised if you wouldn't if you couldn't get it uh, get it published. It's just a matter of, of submitting it. Yeah. Okay. Fabulous. All right. Um, is there anything else before we wrap this up that you feel that you'd like to share with the with listeners who have an opportunity to hear from you now? Uh, inflammatory arthritis. Any sort of final words? So um, you know, I'd uh, encourage people to look at uh, at some of the turmeric work, and so it's not just plant-based in general, but there are specific plants that may have additional benefits. And there's spiced turmeric, so there's actually some trials um, using the spice to uh, calm down inflammation, um, specifically in rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and some of these other autoimmune conditions. And so it's just a matter of going to nutritionfacts.org and typing in rheumatoid arthritis or typing in autoimmune and you know just looking through the videos. I have about more than a thousand videos on basically any topic. And if people have questions, my contact information is there. I'd be happy to answer questions. Everything on the website is free. There's no ads, not selling anything. Just kind of put it up as a public service. So I encourage people, and I'm constantly on the lookout for a new science. I know uh, um, for all, all types of autoimmune and inflammatory conditions, uh, from asthma, psoriatic arthritis on down, um, I already have a lot of information up and will continue to, to dredge the literature for all the new good stuff and so I encourage people to subscribe and you can get uh, daily, weekly, monthly updates however you'd like um, and uh, hopefully one day I'll uh, come down to Australia and be able to speak around and uh, meet people in person. Well, maybe we can uh, organize that. I'm doing an event with Dr. Clapper on the 12th of April at University Great. of New South Wales here in Sydney. Um, and very much looking forward to that. So we're going to do an evening with, with myself and him talking about uh, natural reversing uh, mechanisms for, for RA. 
Um, and uh, yeah, if you were to come down here, or maybe we could organise something in the future, then uh, I'd love to love to meet you and to work with you in Sounds that sense. Great. Sounds uh, great. Sounds great. Say hello to Clapper for me. I, I will. He's a he's a great man. Um, I'm with so you. I just like to uh, say a big thank you to your grandma who set all this up. Uh, uh, you know uh, what a what a wonderful woman uh, to uh, to you know be able to inspire you like she did and and so forth. And what we haven't. What we haven't gone over, which is probably the biggest news in plant-based world in the last 12 months, of course, is the lack of beard. You've shaved the beard. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, that was actually the publisher. The publisher. So my new book just came out this week uh, here in the States. And the publisher says, oh, yeah, you got to shave that. I was like, all right, I don't care. You know, but it's just funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's created quite, quite a wave, hasn't it? <laughs> it's a funny you know so i posted the picture on facebook and it got more comments than everything else i've ever posted Isn't that really, like i'm posting reversing heart disease reversing high blood pressure yeah a couple thousand people like it but i say what do you think of the no beer that, that gets more you know it's ridiculous it, it's like it's like melting melting the internet <laughs> Oh, that's, 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 that's fabulous. Fun. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, please don't stop the uh, all the work that you do. It's absolutely outstanding. And I, and I refer to your website uh, regularly. And I'm going to post a uh, link to your website and also links to a couple of the videos specifically. I'll embed them on this blog post. Oh, great, great. Um, and um, yeah, uh, and I'd encourage people to uh, also, are you speaking publicly in the US at the moment anywhere? Are they all private talks? Oh, no, no, they're all, they're public. They're oh, all public. public. So I got 60, Thanks. about 60 cities that's in six countries in the next two months. So I hope people will check it out. Yeah, you can't miss him. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Gregor. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Bye-bye.